So before we begin, I just wanted to start off with a couple of thank yous. So first of all, I just want to thank um, all of you guys that are watching that were in PF this year or last year. You guys are what makes this like activity so great and so much fun and so competitive. And then also, obviously specifically, I want to thank Annie and Bryce for being just great opponents this year and last year every time we faced them. It has been really awesome. Um, I also want to thank my parents for dealing with my debate shenanigans for two years now and everything that's uh, come from that. Mr. Smith, our Westside's head uh, debate coach, I took his class last year and he introduced me to like the fundamentals, deba fundamentals of debate and he really got me interested in activity. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Uh, ben Carson, uh, Westside's PF coach. You're an awesome coach and an awesome friend, Ben. You've taught me so much about debate and I really appreciate all the help you've given. Um, I also want to thank everyone that's on like both my team and specifically on PF for just you know helping us out. And, being a great team for the course of this year, and specifically for this tournament this week and districts last week. Um, I want to thank Claire, who's not here, but she graduated last year. She helped me at RGN a lot this month and provided me a lot of guidance when I first started that debate last year. Um, she was a debater last year. Um, I want to thank Brian. He's not here right now because he's in the policy finals, but he was my PF partner last year, and I learned a lot about PF with him over the course of that season. And then finally, of course, I want to thank Arjun. Um, We've been debate partners this year, but I've known Arjun since fourth grade. He's one of the first people met, I met when I first moved to Indiana. And not just debate, but I've learned so much about like general academics and just um, you know general stuff for, over the years from you. And you've been an awesome friend and a debate partner. Thank you. So with that being said, are all my judges ready? In a world of international conflict, United States involvement simply adds fuel to the fire. Because of this, Arjun and I strongly negate the resolution. Resolved in order to better respond to international conflict, the United States should significantly increase its military spending. Contention number one is going to be developing dependency. James Fearon of Stanford University explains the nations naturally respond to threats. However, allies tend to rely on the United States and often won't increase military spending or posture if they see America is doing the job for them. Fu of Singapore University quantifies that every 1% increase in U.S. military expenditure reduces the spending of all allies in a region by 0.3%. This military dependency is extremely harmful. Fearon furthers that the only good way to get rid of threats in the long run is to let local actors develop their own security. This is because local actors understand the nature of conflict better than external actors like the United States. Unfortunately, Boise State empirically confirms that U.S. presence decreases the military development of other states, leading to a net decrease in security. One example of the harms of dependency is Iraq. Nazari of Real News writes that the United States made Iraq dependent on the United States for security, and since then, Iraq has been vulnerable to all possible threats on the outside because it can no longer defend itself. The end result of this dependency is state collapse. Mueller of International Studies quarterly finds that the probability of collapse among military independent states was only 22%, but military dependence on the United States increases the chance of collapse to 90%. States that have failed to develop their own security are unable to stop the rise of insurgencies and terrorists. In fact, James Piazza of UNC Law finds that state failure increases transnational terrorism, our number one national security threat, by 1,400%. Now, contention number two is going to be worsening the violence. We're going to have two subpoints here. Subpoint A is going to be irresponsible intervention. Kane of Stanford in 2016 finds empirically that when the United States increases spending on its troops, it leads the United States to being more active abroad, specifically through military intervention. This is problematic because Stephen Kinzer of the Boston Globe in 2015 writes that the United States intervenes to overthrow regimes without plans to establish peace. American intervention thus historically fails, such as in Libya, where intervention killed more people than it saved. The Military Times further said the new administra administration could intervene in Iraq, Syria, or a host of other countries, and there are three impacts of this increased intervention. Firstly, increased civilian casualties. The Journal of Peace Research in 2012 finds that just a one standard deviation increase in intervention troops increases civilian casualties by 40% as foreign intervention results in a high amount of collateral damage. The second impact is increased terrorist recruitment. The Naval Postgraduate School finds that collateral damage caused to civilians by external forces causes popular support for the insurgents, thus increasing the recruitment and the power of the insurgency in the long run. In turn, the duration of conflict increases, leading to our final impact, number three, which is increasing conflict length. Dillon of the International Studies Quarterly finds that foreign intervention increases the duration of conflict by 350%. Finally, subpoint B is going to be more arms, more harms. Point of George Mason University in 2014 finds that the U.S. government provides 80% of the total arms market in the world. 
He concludes that an increase in spending increases arms export as it frees up older weapons to be sold abroad for a profit. To Coyne of McClare, Claremont McKenna College confirms in 2016 that just a 10% increase in military spending leads to an 11% increase in arms exports. And the reason this is significant is because he finds that it is next to impossible to track these weapons once they are sold. And there are two huge reasons to be alarmed because of this. Firstly, small arms with big issues. According to the Center for American Progress, an estimated 1 million U.S. exported small arms are stolen or lost worldwide each year. This is problematic as Shaw of Global Issues writes that the growing availability of small arms increases the number of conflicts and hinders global peace. He quantifies that small arms has 90% of civilian casualties in conflict and the majority of these come from the United States. The second impact is funding terrorism. Zachary Cohen of CNN notes in 2015 that American weapons given to Iraq have freely flowed through the Middle East and have fallen into the hands of armed terrorist groups, flaming the Syrian civil war that has killed nearly 500,000 people. Holistically, the London School of Economics quantifies that just a 1% increase in U.S. arms exports raises the count of anti-American terrorism by 110%. And for all these reasons, Arjun and I are so proud to negate in today's round. Mr. Dutton um, for inspiring me to just do my very best. I also need to thank Jeremy Starkweather for um, keeping me calm today and yesterday and really um, just being a great person to look up to. And also Mrs. Troyer for being another great support system. And I'm so blessed to have met you guys and have you have been a part of my debate experience. I need to thank all my opponents, Randy and Arjun, because without them, obviously we wouldn't be here. Uh, public Forum is, means so much to me and it's so nice to see that everyone else has the same love for it as I do and my partner. And going on my partner, I need to thank Bryce for not only putting up with me for an ungodly amount of time, but um, being being my support system and really uh, just making me laugh when I need to happen. So that being said, are my judges ready? Are my phones ready? Is my partner ready? All right, let's begin. My partner and I stand in firm affirmation of the following resolution. Resolved, in order to better respond to international conflicts, the United States should significantly increase its military spending. Because of the nature of this resolution, the affirmative team offers the following definitions. Respond, to make a return by some action as if an answer. International conflicts, conflicts between different nation states and conflicts between people and organizations in different nation states. Also, intergroup conflicts within one country when one group is fighting for independence or increased social, political, and or economic power. Should, indicates that operative action is necessary. Significantly, in an important way or to an important degree. Connection one, the United States military budget is insufficient. According to the National Defense Panel, the threats to America and her interests following World War II prompted America's leaders to employ our extraordinary economic, diplomatic, and military power to establish and support the current rules-based international order that has greatly furthered global peace and prosperity and ushered in an era of post-war affluence for the American people. This order is not self-sustaining. It requires active, robust American engagement. America provides this international leadership because it greatly enhances America's own security and prosperity. Our policy of active global engagement has been so beneficial and is so ingrained that those who retreat from it have a heavy burden of proof to present an alternative that would better serve the security interests and well-being of the United States of America. America's global military capability and commitment has been the strategic foundation undergirding our global leadership. The defense budget cuts mandated by the Budget Control Act 2011, coupled with additional cuts and constraints on defense management under the laws sequestering provision, constitute a serious strategic misstep on the part of the United States. Not only have they caused significant investment shortfalls in U.S. military readiness and both present and future capabilities, they have prompted our current potential allies and adversaries to question our commitment and resolve. Unless reversed, these shortfalls lead to a high risk force in the near future. That in turn lead to an America that is not only less secure, but far less prosperous. The effectiveness of America's other tools for global influence, such as diplomacy and economic engagement, are critically intertwined with and dependent upon the perceived strength, presence, and commitment of the U.S. The capabilities and capacities rightly called for in the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review clearly exceed the budget resources made available to the department. This gap is disturbing, if not dangerous, in light of the fact that global threats and challenges are rising, including a troubling pattern of territorial assertiveness and regional intimidation on China's part, the recent aggression of Russia and Ukraine, nuclear proliferation on the part of North Korea and Iran, a serious insurgency in Iraq that both reflects and fuels the broader sectarian conflicts in the region, the civil war in Syria, and the civil strife in the larger Middle East and throughout Africa. 
These are among the trends that mandate increased defense funding. In this rapidly changing environment, U.S. military superiority is not a given. Maintaining the operational and technological edge of our armed forces requires sustained and targeted investment. Connection 2. The United States would see benefits. According to Thanis Kavanis, a former professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs on Syria, increased U.S. intervention would represent a useful reassertion of American, of American power and engagement in the crisis. It would achieve multiple humanitarian and strategic aims. At worst, the Syrian crisis would be as problematic as it, as it is today, but there would be fewer civilian casualties, and the United States would gain leverage with its allies on other matters because of its beefed-up engagement in Syria. At best, a more aggressive U.S. effort in Syria would limit Russian overreach, increase the likelihood of a political solution, and roll back some of the destabilizing regional consequences of the Syrian implosion. Even in failure, increased intervention would work a correction of American policy in the Middle East, which today suffers from a credibility gap, driven by two mutually reinforcing mistakes. First, an over-eagerness to pull away from regional crises, even when those crises implicate core U.S. national security interests. And second, a major gap between rhetoric and practice. Syria was just one example of the benefits the United States could gain, and it's for these reasons and many more I can only see a ballot affirmation for today's debate. Uh, I'll start with uh, all my fellow debaters in public forum over the years. 
As Randy said, this is what makes the activity really great. I've really enjoyed debating everyone here and all the people who aren't here in PF these last three years. Um, Chesterton debaters, you've always made me more motivated in order so we can knock you out of state. Ch uh, Monster, all you guys too. Um, specifically Connor and Shreyas. Connor, I had my second ever debate round against him and he's been like pretty motivating presence in debate since then, so thanks for that. Um, and all the other schools as well, really important. Um, next I'd like to thank my family. Um, my dad's actually in the audience right now judging, so thanks for being here. And my mom's in India right now, but if she ever watches the video, I love you. Um, everyone else in my family has been very supportive. My sister was actually the one who got me into debate, so I thank her for that. And then um, for my teammates, uh, especially the PFers, it's been a joy being your teammate these past three years, two years for some of you guys, one year for the novices, it's been awesome. Um, you guys are why I love this activity and all the other categories. Uh, I love all you guys, regardless of whether you're in policy or not. Um, <laughs> Finally, to my coaches, uh, Ben and Mr. Smith, you guys are amazing. You're, you're the people who really propel this program for, forward. Uh, ben, uh, you've been an awesome PF coach. Hopefully you get a 3 P right here. Um, and finally, to Randy, um, you've been my best, one of my best friends since fourth grade, as he said, and it's been really awesome debating with you this past year. And also, yeah, um, Claire and Linus, who are my partners these past years, they also taught me a lot for sure. So I thank them as well. All right. Yeah, yeah any advice? Thanks for <laughs> debating, coming here. It's, I mean, I've never actually debated you guys before, but I'm sure it'll be fun. All right. The terrorism study comes from Neumeier of the London Ex School of Economics. That's what they asked for in the last crossfire. Finally, they tell you that Iraq was only one minor setback, but we actually give you a holistic analysis from the Journal of Peace Research in 2012 that does a meta-analysis of multiple different conflicts and finds in every case a one standard deviation increase in troops leads to 40% more civilian casualties. This is really, really bad because in their second contention, they're going to talk about putting troops on the ground in Syria. That's going to be really, really bad because the same study tells you that if you put troops on the ground in Syria, it's only going to further inflame the conflict and get the same harms as our Journal of Peace Research studies tells you. They show you no solvency or no actual empirical benefits on the ground to increasing troops. Okay, let's go to our proponents first contention and start going through things one by one. They're basically talking about how the U.S. budget is insufficient. They're saying this international order of global leadership or hegemony is going to be a good thing. The problem is, Carla Norrell from Foreign Affairs in 2016 writes that U.S. hegemony is already extremely high. We don't need to increase military spending. Our opponents need to show you someone who's threatening U.S. hegemony before we need to justify an increase in spending. As long as it's already dwarfing the next, all the countries in the world combined, our budget's higher than everyone else combined right now, they need to give you a tangible reason for why hegemony is a threat in order for you to buy this contention. But even if you don't buy that, I'm going to turn this contention and show you how this hegemony is actually going to create more harm to the United States' interests. According to the University of Pittsburgh in 2016, they find that this global, global leadership or rules-based order opponents are talking about really isn't that good. They find that it actually fuels anti-American sentiment because the United States tends to intervene in states in order to impose some type of imperialistic dominance. Whenever the United States feels that any area is unstable or they want to pursue their interests, they intervene with troops and they actually create more conflict as we show you in our first and second contentions. Judge, look to the empirics on the ground. Don't buy their rhetoric. Look to the actual tangible statistics. When you see increased intervention, you get more troop uh, like backlash against civilians you get more recruitment and you get more terrorism. But on the ground, you're not going to see this rules-based order actually getting any benefits. Finally, let's look to what they talk about in the second half of this contention. Basically, they're talking about readiness and allies. Judge, they're going to be giving this theme of readiness throughout the round and saying, oh, the United States needs to maintain superiority in its military. But the problem is, Mossy of the International Business Times tells you that U.S. military superiority is not the determinant of success in conflict. Rather, troop legitimacy and an understanding of the conflict are the main determinant of success. The problem is, the United States does not have an understanding of the conflict because it's an external actor that can't actually communicate with the local population and gain intelligence. That's going to be really important. Important because if you look at our first contention, when we increase troops according to Boise State University, the host state and the regional actors decrease their presence. That's going to be a net harm because those actors actually do understand the conflict. That's why you're increasing the probability of state collapse from 22% to 87%. They talk about allies, but allies aren't really allies of their failed states. The United States intervention is spreading state failure. That's not creating effective allies. We're creating effective allies on our side of the resolution. 
The next thing they're going to be talking about here is they're talking about basically a bunch of conflicts like China, Russia, and they list out a bunch of these. First of all, they never show you anywhere in any of these conflicts where empirically United States military spending is actually going to make the situation better. They're just saying, oh, there's all these conflicts. How do we know military spending would be a better response? They give you no empirical evidence anywhere in their case. You can drop their case right there. Finally, let's go to the second tension. They're talking about benefits here. Now, finally, they try to give you, okay, we're going to actually have some benefits in Syria. But judge, realize this is just the opinion of one author. They need to provide actual tangible empirical evidence or some kind of statistics in order for you to weigh this in the round. Remember, the Economist in 2016 reports that putting troops on the ground in Syria would only further inflame the conflict. They warned this by saying putting troops on the ground would give ISIS a way to increase recruitment by giving it a way to rally around the flag because all the people in um, Syria and all these militaries in countries don't actually trust the United States Western presence. Thus, if we do actually intervene in Syria, like our opponents are advocating for, you're only going to, one, increase civilian casualties, two, increase ISIS recruitment, and three, increase the duration of conflict. Don't for the vote for this kind of stuff. Make sure that you're actually ending conflict and not causing it to get even worse, and make sure you vote negative. Thank you. So in an effort not to be the odd man out, I suppose I'm also going to make a couple of thank yous real quick here before we get to our rebuttal. Um, it feels a little strange for, for me to be on this stage right now. Uh, you know, my, my partner and my opponents are talking about all these wondrous debate memories that they have. And this is my first year out. And so it's, it's pretty cool for me to be standing where I'm standing right now. And I am incredibly honored for this opportunity. Uh, to start with, I have to thank my uh, debate coach and my speech coach, because that's where I started out, Mr. Dutton. He has been such a role model to me. I have learned just about everything I know um, forensically, just about everything I know in any aspect of performance uh, from his tutelage and his teaching. And uh, I'm honored by the trust that he has in me. I would also like to thank Penn's entire debate team just for all of the support that they've shown me throughout this year and kind of their coaching as well as I treaded around and tried to find my sea legs throughout the year and finally got a grip, it looks like. Uh, so that's been really fun to be a part of. Uh, I'd like to thank my opponents, Randy and Arjun, uh, for being very quality debaters. I can already tell that this is going to be a super fun round, and I'm very, very excited to be a part of it. Um, I want to thank all of you here. Obviously, uh, you're all, for the most part, what makes this event as much fun as it is. And it's been a blast to compete in this year. And I'm kind of bummed out that I don't get to do this again, that this is my, my last hurrah through here, my first and only. Um, and I would be incredibly remiss if I did not thank my wonderful partner, Annie, who kind of roped me into this whole shebang in the first place. I would not be here if it weren't for her. And I definitely would not be of any value if it weren't for her continual tutelage and, and her belief in me. Uh, so just a huge thank you to her, as well as all of you involved. And with that being said, all five judges ready? Are my opponents ready? Is my partner ready? Yes. Very well. Let's begin. I would like to start this rebuttal by first addressing our opponent's first contention, which, which is this idea of dependency, and how if we continue to increase the United States budget, then our allies are going to continue to depend on us. The fact of the matter is, we have a lot of allies, and we have a lot of allies who we are sworn to protect. Since World War II, the United States has signed defense pacts with more than 60 countries. In addition to that, we are also pledged to defend every member state of NATO if they ever fall into conflict or fall under attack. And so, in order to do this, we do need this significant increase. Combat is changing, it's more unpredictable, and we have to be ready for when that strikes because we have an obligation to our allies and our interests to be ready to respond when conflict inevitably comes knocking. Their second contention is this idea about how an increase in military spending worsens uh, the violence that we're trying to prevent. Here's the thing, this isn't all about military might. This isn't about the capability to just 
walk into another country and wipe it out. Any country can do that. That's not what we're trying to achieve here. What we want, what United States interests are, are in building democracies and reflecting United States interests. And in order to do this, we need people on the ground. We need local people who know local customs, people who know the local languages, people who have influence in these countries that we are trying to assist in times of conflict so that they can help promote the U.S. agenda and United States interests. And they need the best tools that money can buy. And without this significant increase in military spending, we are shorting them the resources that we need to truly move further and to truly respond better to this international conflict. Now, one of the things that they have brought up as well is that troops are a bad thing and more troops automatically means more terrorism. But let's look at what happens throughout history when we pull troops. Very recently, uh, just after 2008, when Barack Obama was sworn into office, one of the first things he did was begin gradually cutting military spending. And with this cut in military spending, we also started pulling troops out of the Middle East, namely Afghanistan. And things were fine for a while, and then things heated up really, really quick. We saw increased violence and tension in Tunisia. We saw a re-increase in the tension and violence in Afghanistan. Libya and Egypt grew very, very hostile. Russia advanced on Crimea and the Ukraine. We've been down this road before. This is not our first rodeo with these situations. And if we don't keep evolving, if we don't keep providing our military with the tools that they need in this ever-changing world of combat, we are going to fall behind. They brought up the fact that we already spend more than a lot of other countries in the military combined. Yes, that's, that statement is true. America currently spends more than the next seven countries combined on its military. However, not more than 10 years ago, that number was 13. We spent more than the next 13 countries combined. We are now down to seven. Although that might not seem like a huge issue, we are beginning to fall behind. People are seeing that in recent years, we have brought the military budget down, and that is enabling them to find new advantages to take the United States on. And this isn't just about defending our allies, but also about defending ourselves. Like I said, conflict is ever-changing. It has evolved. Conflict has never been as deadly as it is today. It is faster, it is more lethal, and it is way, way more unpredictable. And in order to best respond to these continually changing circumstances of conflict, we need this significant increase so we can be ready when conflict inevitably does strike. And it is for these reasons, as well as many more, that I can see nothing other than a vote and affirmation for today's debate. Thank you. intervene or did this type of helping the local people thing you're telling me and people's lives were empirically saved? Um, the Korean War, South Korea is now a thriving country and that was United States intervention. Okay, wait, didn't we lose the Korean War? South like, Korea is currently a thriving nation. The I mean, United States intervened. Hold up, you asked up. for an example and I gave you one. Okay, can you give me one like in more recent years like where we actually saved more lives than we harmed because in the Korean War, we actually created conflict with China and North Korea that killed hundreds of thousands of people for the purpose of eliminating communism. Unfortunately, I do not have uh, casualty counts, so I could not give you an example where I could explicitly state. So you don't have any evidence that we saved. So you don't have any evidence that says that we saved more lives than we killed in intervention. I do not have casualty counts with me right now. No, I do not. Okay. May Thank I you. ask you a question? Sure. Could you give, there were some statistics from, from your second contention involving yes. an increase in civilian, civilian casualties, yes. increase in terror recruitment, increased conflict length, and right. things like that. Yes. Could you give me uh, dates for those studies and revelations? Okay, so we give you Stanford in 2016, that's Tim Kane, he's a professor of international relations, he says when you increase spending on troops, that empirically causes more intervention. Then we go okay. to the Journal of Conflict Resolution, that's in 2012, that finds holistically over the history of intervention, a one standard deviation increase in intervention leads to 40% more casualties. Okay. Then we give the Naval Postgraduate School in 2015, that finds you increased recruitment for terrorist organizations. And finally, we end with the International Studies Quarterly, I believe it's in 2013, but I'm not exactly sure, my partner can bring it up. Okay. And he finds you increased conflict duration by 350%. And I want to note that all of these studies are looking at across history trends. They're not just looking at one conflict, they're looking at what happens in general. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? Yeah. 
Sure, okay, so you talk about like these local people or local troops are, are better, they understand the conflict, right? Yes. Sure, okay, so if the United States, when they go in, that crowds out these local forces away from the conflict, like the more we do, the less these local troops do, how is that a good thing? Okay, what, what I was saying, and I don't want this to get misconstrued, so allow sure. me to clarify if that's sure. okay. Yeah. Um, it, would it be safe to say that the, the end goal of the United States, we don't just want to wipe out countries. We want to inevitably, we want to help them. And we right, want we want to create them. stability. Okay. Correct. Right, the, the end goal is always stability. Sure. And so in order to achieve this stability, it isn't just about overwhelming military force. I agree. I'm right. showing you that when and the United States that's where I'm moving towards. Sure. That's where I'm moving towards. And so in order, in order to achieve that, what you need is you need to be able to enlist the help of, of local people. You okay. need people who you can recruit who know local languages, know local customs, know right. what's going on. Is that what that costs need? money, and you need okay. uh, the best tools for them, which is also okay. a significant cost. Okay, I have two questions to that. All right, I will try to answer as much as I can. Sure. One, what percent of the time when the United States increases spending does it do what you're talking about? And second, how does the United States know who the good guys and the bad guys are? What we show you in our second contention is most of the time when we arm these people or help these people that you're talking about, we end up helping the terrorist organizations. Like 80% of the time when we help people in the Middle East, they end up like giving their exports to the terrorist organizations. Unfortunately, that is time. All right, sure. Um, before we begin, I'm going to quickly address Crossfire, and I'm going to go over the responses he made to our case during his rebuttal. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, I'm going to address Crossfire, do a general overview of the round, and then address what, he's gonna, what he said in response to the rebuttal. So at the, near the end of Crossfire, they were just asking for the dates on the cards. Arjun said he wasn't sure about that last card, about the increase in conflict duration by 350%. Just to clarify, it was 2016. Okay, I want to give a quick overview of the round now. The most important thing to remember when analyzing clash in this round is empirical evidence versus author opinions. When you have a topic as controversial as military spending, there's going to be a lot of authors on every side of the issue with a lot of different opinions. And because of this, statistical impacts should always be weighed above author opinions. If you look to our opponents' impacts, they literally don't give you a single number. And for the rest of this round, if they can't give you a single time, the intervention has actually worked, or a single time the diplomacy backed with increased military spending has actually worked, you're going to vote con right now. Keeping that in mind, let's go over what they said about our case. The first thing they're going to say to our first contention is that we have a lot of defensive packs with 60 countries. This is literally completely irrelevant. It doesn't even respond to our contention. The point is, like they already admitted, we spent more than the seven next seven countries combined. We have enough money to defend our allies. The point is, whenever we try to, we make the conflict worse. This is actually a bad thing. Second of all, they're going to drop all of our examples in the rest of our first contention. In my first crossfire with Andy, she literally admitted there will be intervened in Iraq, we made the situation worse there. Like, and, they, they, they're not, and they're not bringing up any other examples of when intervention was actually successful. Moving on to our second contention, their first um, response here is that our intervention actually helps local governments reform. The problem here, once again, is they don't give you an actual number or any empirical evidence. This is literally just an author opinion. We're literally telling you in our case, Boise, um, Boise State University and Rice University both find that when we intervened in places like Iraq, they became dependent on us, and as a result, they were, um, started edging closer to state collapse, and the end result was worse for them. Then they're going to talk about how when we pull out, conflict gets worse. Once again, this is an author their opinion. We're literally telling you that the Journal of Peace Research finds that when you control for all other variables, a 1% one, one standard deviation increase in U.S. intervention troops increases civilian casualties by 40%. And this happens in conflicts in the real world right now, like Iraq. For example, when we're talking about Iraq, after we intervened in Iraq, terrorism in Iraq increased by 600%. This is a huge impact in today's round. So, and uh, finally, I want to address the subpoint B of our second contention, which our opponents clean drop. Remember, here we're talking about arms exports. This contention or this subpoint is so important right now because the only reason why these terrorists have arms in the first place is because we're giving to them. And for all these reasons, I can no longer a con ballot. Thank you. I'm going to start by just briefly uh, addressing my opponents' contentions and the attacks we've made on them. So, first of all, their first contention is developing dependency. So, my opponents claim is we don't need to see this increase in military spending because we don't want our um, allies to become more dependent on our, on our military spending. Now, I go to Donald Trump for the answer to this. So, Donald Trump has stated that early in my term, I will also be requesting that all NATO nations promptly pay their bills. What that's saying is Donald Trump is going to request that all 28 members of NATO start paying their bills. Therefore, we're going to see a decrease in dependency because Donald Trump is also calling for an increase in military spending. Therefore, the first contention in developing dependency is 
it's not going to get worse with an increase in military spending because of the current administration, because of the Trump administration. Now, going on to their second mention, which is about worsening violence. Okay, so the United States must be a proactive instead of a reactive entity. We cannot wait for this thing to happen to be like, we don't have enough, we're, we, we're caught with nowhere to turn. The United States must take a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach. We must continue to build our military funds so we continue to be a power that our allies can look for. As my partner mentioned in his rebuttal, we have 60 defense pact. We are signing 60 defense pacts to defend the, our allies and all 28 members of NATO. Now, with NATO members paying their bills, we still need this increase in military spending because we still need to maintain this power. Now, going back to their um, third contention about or about their sub point B of their second contention, more arms, more harms. Basically, but they don't solve for this. Even in our current military budget, we see these problems. We see that they're like, is ISIS still getting access to these weapons? Yes, they cannot prove, they cannot provide a direct link that because an increase in military spending is going to increase the number of arms, the quantity of arms that ISIS is going to get among other terrorist groups. Therefore, until my funds can provide the direct link, this is going to go up. Uh, that contention also falls. Now, briefly going over my own contentions. The military budget, budget is insufficient. As I've already stated, our allies look to us to maintain and continue to be a big military power. We are sending to 60 defense packs and we must must continue to maintain our uh, military edge over the other countries. And again, the United States and Syria, I said even in failure, we would see increased um, American efforts in Syria. We, we, I said many benefits in my very first uh, speech, and for these reasons and many more, I can only see a valid affirmation for today's debate. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, so you say we don't have a link between increased military spending and arms to ISIS. So if we're showing you that increased military spending places old weapons to be sent there, then it's not a link. What do you mean by like sent there? Like, like they're sold? Like yeah, they're, they're sold. So basically what we're showing you from point of, and I'm kind of, oh, sorry, George Mason University, is that we sell our old weapons to governments like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, other countries, and these rebel groups that you're talking about to arm them. And what happens is 80% of the time they get intercepted or those actors are not trustworthy and end up giving them the That's why 80% of the experts we sent to the Middle East end up in terrorist or terrorist affiliated do you have another question? Would you like to ask another question? Um, I mean, you can ask the same question. I can ask another question. Yeah. Okay, so, all right, so if we're increasing the amount of power that these terrorists groups have by increasing spending, how is that sustaining the global order or actually better responding to conflict? Could you please clarify that question? Okay, so ISIS has like 80%, sorry, 80% of our exports to the Middle East end up in the hands of terrorist organizations, increasing their power. That's why the LSE finds that a 1% increase in exports leads to 100% and 110% more terrorism. How is that a better response to conflict? So, so what you're asking is just by increasing it and arms getting intercepted, how is that a better response? Yeah, how is that like, why is that a reason to affirm this? The, the better response the isn't, isn't found from small arms exports, the better response is that we need these advances in, in technological capabilities okay, sure. as well as military okay, capabilities. So can you give me a study rate. that says that newer technology empirically, like, how many lives is the same compared to older technology? Uh, right off, no, I cannot, but I will look to get to that in my final okay. focus. Because, like, the newest right. drones that we have in the Institution in 2016, the newest drones, for every one terrorist you kill when you do a drone strike, you kill 50 civilians. They're not very good. So, and like, like we've said multiple times, this isn't just about sheer military Okay, sure, yeah, so, that's a really good point. Let's talk about the local actors. Okay. So, wait, how are we going to get these local actors to come in if whenever we go in, they leave? Well, what exactly do you mean by that? So, Boise State and Stanford are saying, the more we do fight ISIS, the less the local actors are doing, because we crowd them out, because we provide the security that's the defendant. But, how is this, like, how are we accessing your... Okay, so, so what we're doing, in, in order to, to better fight these groups, what we need are, are these local actors, and it's, it's this recruitment, and we need the money so that we can rely a little more on them to assist us in that sense, because they do know what's going on, and because they are the ones with the knowledge, and they need the so, best tools that money can buy as well, so that they can properly defend themselves, and with the military budget that we currently have right now, we cannot do that to the fullest of capabilities. Cut it off. Okay, so the um, I'll have one observation and three voting issues for my judges today. Um, is everyone ready? Okay, let's begin. 
The standard for evaluating today's round is an objective empirical data versus claims. We're giving you the statistics and the actual studies. Our opponents are just making claims, and they don't respond to what actually happens in the real world. The first voting issue is going to be on arms exports. They completely clean drop this contention in today's round. All they say is we have no link. We provide you the link. When you increase spending on new weapons, that frees up the older weapons to be sent abroad for a profit. The problem is, once you send the weapons abroad, there's no way need to track these weapons according to coin of George Mason University. In fact, our study that Randy brings up to you, and they never respond to according to Oklahoma State University, is that 80% of our exports to the Middle East end up in the hands of ISIS. In fact, ISIS has so many American weapons, they're selling them on Facebook. So that's going to be the first reason to vote negative in today's round. The second voting issue is going to be on dependency. All they say here is that we're, we have we're pledged to defend these allies. But The Economist tells you that we already have enough funding to defend our allies, but more importantly, they never show you why this is a better response. We show you that when we go into these regions, that we're actually decreasing the, the presence and the activity of the local actors. Both sides in today's round agree that local actors and who understand the conflict and who actively can speak the language are, are the best response. But we're the only ones who show you that increasing spending is going to be decreasing the amount of presence of local actors. That's Boise State University who finds empirically that's true, Stanford University in 2016, and we give you McCain of Rice University. They don't respond to any of the evidence. This turns their only main argument. Finally, on intervention. We show you the link between spending and intervention. That comes from their Tim Kaine study from Stanford in 2016. He finds when you increase spending on troops, your, your troop numbers are going to go up from 470,000 to 550,000. That's a new administration's plan. And the United States doesn't just leave our troops lying around. Instead, we send them into other countries. Specifically, they talk about Syria. That's going to be really bad because sending troops to Syria, they just give you an opinion. Oh, it's going to make things more stable. But empirically, you're actually going to make things worse. Remember, we give you the economist analysis that tells you that if you send troops into Syria, it will only allow terrorist groups to give another reason to rally around the flag and increase recruitment because they can increase anti-Western sentiment. But moreover, the Journal of Peace Research finds that a one standard deviation increase in troops across history leads to 40% more civilian casualties. That's a clear reason to sign your ballot negative. Thank you. All five judges ready? Opponents ready? Partner ready. Very well. Let's begin. To begin this final focus, I would first like to look again at our opponent's contention. Their first contention uh, of this dependency, as we have shown, as they admitted, it doesn't even get better under the status quo. They're just trying to prevent it. As we have shown with the current administration's plans, with having NATO pay their dues, we are alleviating some of that dependency with a significant increase in military spending. Their first contention falls. Their second contention has a lot of data, a lot of empirical evidence, a lot of it focused on overseas intervention. And a lot of that data involves the morality of intervention and what happens when we intervene. However, this debate is not about whether or not the United States should get involved. This debate is about when the United States has to get involved, when we're already involved in things, we have to be able to respond, protect, and defend to the best of our abilities. And right now, we cannot do that. Moving to our first contention, that our current military budget is insufficient, our opponents never provided any evidence that says that our current budget is sufficient, because it's not. War is changing, conflict is changing, it's faster, it's deadlier, it is more unpredictable. And with the budget that we have right now, we cannot adequately protect and defend, let alone our allies overseas, but even ourselves. A lot of their talk has been foreign intervention, foreign this, foreign that, but they've yet to bring up anything about the impact that this is going to have on us as a country. And right now, we cannot secure our country to the best of our ability with our current budget. Furthermore, with our second contention, we have listed time and time again some of these benefits uh, from increased involvement in Syria. And this isn't just about troops, it's about peacekeeping talks, and it is about stability. And this isn't just an opinionated piece. A lot of their evidence has come from colleges and professors, and if that's legitimate, then a Columbia University international and public affairs professor is just as legitimate. Right now, we cannot defend and protect to the best of our abilities. We need this significant increase for changing combat. It is for these reasons, as well as many more, that I can see nothing other than a vote of affirmation in today's debate. Thank you.